So please welcome to the stage Ellie Lee. So there's a kind of wisdom that fathers have, and then there's the kind of wisdom that my father has. Um, for example, like when he does things, he thinks he's totally brilliant, and I just think he's crazy. You know, for example, when we first immigrated from Hong Kong, he thought it would be a good uh, idea for all of us to have American names, which would, you know, make sense because it would make the transition a lot easier. And so my dad chose the American name Ming, even though... <laughs> It's like not even his Chinese name. It's just like another Chinese name. It's like a dynasty, you know? So, um, so when we um, came over uh, to this country, we really had nothing. We, would, we were penniless. So in order to s save money, my dad thought it was a really smart idea to um, make and design my first winter coat. I was three years old. And to this day, he thinks it's like the best design. There you go. That's what I But seriously, he thinks it's like, oh, this is great. We should market this. So anyways, um, that's the wisdom that my father has. Um, one more example of his wisdom. Um, one day he came home, and um, there was a sale on belts. And he was like, bought a monogram belt. And he was so excited. He's like, look at this. It had the, this big, shiny letter A on it, even though our family name is Lee. And I was like, <laughs> Dad, why did you get a letter A belt? That doesn't make any sense. He's like, oh, I got A because A is for ace. Which is, you know, like, you have to understand something about Chinese people. Like, Chinese people are obsessed about being number one. Like, you know, um, you know, like, I have a belt now that says so. I'm number one, ace, you know? And, uh, and that's something, like, if you've ever noticed in Chinatowns across the country, like, Chinese business people, like, they always have to find, you know, the best number one name for, for their business in order to bring in all the money and the good fortune, which is why everything's like an imperial dynasty, lucky dragon, number one kitchen. Like that's the whole, that is my dad, like that's his mentality. So, um, so uh, in the first few years of being in this country, he just, you know, he had no time off and worked like crazy and managed to save up a little money to start up his own business. It was a very modest grocery store in Boston's Chinatown. And of course he called it Ming's Market. Um, but in Chinese, the name of it was uh, Penga Xixiang, which literally means cheap price market. <laughs> and, and, um, and it was that, even as a little kid, like, I didn't understand, like, literally, he told me one day that he would, like, mark up something by five cents, you know, or, like, mark up another thing by ten cents, and I was just like, how are you ever going to make money? Like, this business model is insane. It was the wisdom of that, you know, but, um, but you know, strangely enough, like, it, it, almost immediately, he developed a really loyal following in Boston's Chinatown. Um, because for the first time, I think working families and working poor families actually had a place where they could buy affordable, healthy, good groceries and eat well, which is, you know, no small thing when you're poor. Um, so my dad, um, after about 10 years of uh, having this uh, grocery store, he built it up to be a very successful business. And by 1989, he had moved into a, an enormous space. It became uh, New England's largest Asian market. And uh, at the same time that year, I mean, you know, I was a snotty teenager. I still thought, well, you're crazy. You're a successful businessman, but you're nuts. You know, have crazy ideas. And, uh, you know, at the same time, there was this, uh, he had been renting a first floor in this vacant building um, that had been vacant for like 20, no, 30 years. And the landlord was trying to renovate the other floors to try to um, rent it out as retail space. But he was doing everything on the cheap. So instead of hiring a contractor, he was like welding and renovating on his own without pulling permits. So one day, as you can probably expect, something got out of hand and this big fire broke out as he was welding. Um, but it was okay, you know, they got all the, they evacuated the building, about 150 people, and the fire trucks arrived immediately and everything was fine, until the fire department hooked up their hoses to the hydrants and there was no water to fight the fire. And they were like, huh, that's weird, you know, so they went down a couple of blocks and tried the next hydrant and it was totally dry. What had happened was that the city of Boston, a few months prior, they were doing road construction and generally when you... Um, drill, if they drill deep, they turn off the water pressure in case they hit a water main. And when they sealed up the road, they forgot to turn the pressure back up. So the firefighters had no tools to fight the fire. And it was just a disaster. I mean, it was just like an hour later, the building's still on fire and there's no water. They're trying to jerry-rig something from a nearby hydrant like, you know, like 10 blocks away. Um, 
And if, if things couldn't get worse, the fire jumped an alley, and the building next door caught on fire, and on the top floor was 10,000 square feet of illegally stashed fireworks. So, you know, and so firefighters couldn't scale the ladders, and the, so there's like, I mean, it was a surreal moment, because things are exploding from, you know, like in celebration, you know, normally you'd have fireworks, as my dad stood there completely helpless, watching his life's work just be destroyed in a moment through no fault of his own. So I got a call, I was a sophomore at the time in college, and I, I went out to the store the next day when um, it was, you know, kind of just like smoldering, it wasn't on fire anymore. And uh, as I made my approach to the store, I remember seeing like three elderly women across the street and they were crying. And so I went up to them and I said, you know, is everything okay, why are you crying? And the lady looked at me and then she looked at my dad's store, burned down store, and, and pointed and, and teary-eyed said, you know, where are we gonna go now that we don't have a home? And that was kind of like a, a turning point for me. I, I, I hadn't really thought about my dad's store in that way. Like, you know, I just thought it was something he was doing to provide for the family. And, um, but in fact, he was kind of providing for a greater community. Like, you know, these elderly women, they didn't have a community center to go to. They didn't have a public park in Chinatown. And, and this was the only place where they would actually run into their friends. And they spent a lot of time there. In, in a way, it was like a second home. And, um, and I guess it is true, it sounds corny, but like you only really do realize what you have and when you lose it. And so in the months that followed, I kept begging my dad for more stories, you know, and uh, like one time he told me a story about how a little boy, I asked him if people, what he did with people who were shoplifters, you know, because I was really curious. And he said, well, you know, one day I, I caught a kid uh, shoplifting, he was only 10, and um, I, he didn't know who I was. I was kind of following him around. He was just like taking stuff, like stuffing it in his bag, putting it in his pockets. And, and one, at one moment, like he actually took a break from stealing and sat down and started eating the food he had stolen. Like he was just right in the middle of a, an aisle. And my dad came up to him and he didn't know who, the, who he was. He said, hey little boy, have you had enough to eat? And the little boy rubbed his belly. He's like, almost, you know? And, uh, and my dad's like, hey, so where are your parents? He's like, well, um, they're at work. It's like, oh, why aren't you at home? It's like, because there's no food at home. And my dad said, well, you know, when you take stuff, especially if it's at a store and you don't pay for it, it's actually stealing. And the little boy starts getting really nervous, like, oh my God, this guy's gonna get me in trouble. You know, and he's kind of angling for a way to get out. And my dad's like, you know, so in the future, if you don't have anything to eat at home, would you just please just come and find me and ask me for whatever you need. Like, if you ask, I'll give you whatever you want. Just don't steal, because stealing is wrong. And in the months that followed, I think my dad really looked forward to seeing the little boy. And, and it, was, it was these stories I was craving and I was asking my dad, because in, in some way I think I was trying to recreate something that I had lost or had kind of you know, taken for granted. Um, so whenever we went to Chinatown, I remember lots of people would come up to us and say, please, we need a store like this again. When are you going to open up your store? And it was hard because my dad was basically kind of penniless. Like the, the fire had caused about $20 million worth of damage, and he barely had enough insurance to cover it. I mean, it was like not just inventory, but like the bean sprout machine, like the machine that he leased to wash and dry bean sprout. I mean, stuff like that. And so he really had no money, but he had this idea that maybe he could pool together what little money he did have with a lot of the original employees, um, people for whom they were, they were immigrants and they got their first jobs through my dad at the store. I'd been working there since the 70s. So they pulled together, it was a big risk. The only location that they could find was just on the outskirts of Chinatown, which in the early 90s during the last recession, it was like a no man's land. It's like this area really, like it was so unsafe and the only reason you would ever go there is to like get a prostitute or drugs, you know, it's like, it was so unsafe and at the time I remember in college thinking like, what's the wisdom of that? Like, why are you going there? It's so unsafe, no one's gonna go. It's just gonna, you're gonna lose your life savings. But he did it anyways, cause he's crazy, you know? And he, um, and almost kind of overnight, the place was revitalized, you know? There were really loyal people that, families from the suburbs came and, and gave patronage to my dad, you know, people walked from Chinatown. And then soon thereafter, more and more businesses started popping up. And then there was more and more foot traffic, and then, and then families started moving back into the neighborhood, and it was an amazing thing. Like, he kind of helped revitalize this neighborhood to the point that then 15 years later, it became one of the most valuable pieces of real estate in Boston, which is why um, my dad got an eviction notice from the owner, because he wanted to kick my dad out and knock down the whole block and build luxury condos. This was a few years ago. So I remember my dad at the time was 70, and I said, you know, Dad, what do you want to do? Like, you have like 90 employees and 
like they're all in their 40s and 50s, you know, they don't speak English, they're kind of very hard to employ, like what's gonna happen to them? And I remember, my, remember at the time my dad said, you know, um, you know, I'm 70 years old, I'm too old for this, you know, I'm too old to fight. And I understand when my dad says that, but um, at the time I, I decided that I wasn't too old to fight. So I organized the community and, um, sorry, <laughs> I organized the community and um, led this grassroots roots movement to fight City Hall and fight one of the largest developers in all of Boston to try to hold ground. <laughs> um, and at our first public hearing, it was a, a really amazing turnout and, and we got enough press that even the mayor changed his tune and started supporting where we were coming from. It was an incredible thing. So after the first initial hearing, I remember going to the store afterwards and, uh, and immediately when I walked in, there was these two older women who were, who were my dad's employees and they, came, they rushed right up to me and I said, thank you so much for what you did last night. You know, we normally don't think that we have a voice and we normally don't think we can advocate for ourselves in that kind of way, so thank you for, for doing what you did. And when I, look into, well, look, when I looked into their eyes, I think I felt like the same feeling probably that my dad felt when he saw the boy that once shoplifted or saw the, the old women outside the store weeping. And when I looked into their eyes, I saw so much compassion and humility and grace. And it was at that moment that um, I understood the wisdom that my father had given me. Thank you. Ellie Lee.